Welcome to Watermark's Church Leadership Podcast, a conversation with church leaders for church leaders. I'm your host, John McGee. Thanks so much for joining us today. Hey friends, I've got a special episode for you today. We are going to play for you uh, what was our opening session of CLC 2024. And it was a topic that we kind of went back and forth on and we had locked it in months and months before, but just said, hey, is this really the way we want to open this conference? People are going to fly in from all over the world. Is this the very first bullet we want to fire? And um, it wasn't a, a tip. It wasn't a, a technique or a strategy. Um, what what T.A. Timothy Atik talked about was prayer. And he talked about the, the importance of prayer, both for a leader, uh, for a church. And he talked about our own journey uh, as a church to not simply be a, a church that prays, but to be a praying church and shared some of the things that we've done. Some of those might be helpful to you. And so not a traditional leadership topic, but I think will be something that will be very, very helpful to you. So without any further ado, please listen to this opening session from CLC 2024 by our friend, Timothy Atik. All right. How we doing? Man, it is, uh, it's great to see you guys. Welcome to Watermark. Uh, man, I am so expectant for all God has in store for all of us collectively over the next couple days. So thank you for trusting us with your time. Uh, when I was in high school, uh, I was driving and um, I wanted to take a college visit to College Station, Texas to visit Texas A&M University. I grew up in Dallas, I was living in Dallas and I convinced my parents to allow me to make the trip to College Station by myself. But at the time, GPS didn't exist. Google Maps was not a thing. Our phones were no, not smart yet. And so how did we get to where we needed to go before smartphones? I went to my dad. I was like, how do I get to College Station? He was like, you're going to get on this road and go on that road for a long time. Then you're going to take a left and go on that road for a long time, and then you're going to hit it. I was like, that sounds great. I'll just do that. And so I got in the car. It's about a three-hour journey from Dallas to College Station, and I began to head south on I-35. And when I got to Waco, uh, I got on Highway 6 to head to College Station. And I had been on Highway 6 for about an hour, and I was so surprised that I had not yet seen a sign for College Station. And so I just made the decision, I'll just wait a little bit longer. And I waited a little bit longer and still no sign of College Station. So I just decided this has to be right. I'll just wait a little bit longer. So I waited a little bit longer. And after a little bit longer, I was like, surely at some point College Station is just going to miraculously appear. So I waited a little bit longer. And after I had waited a little bit longer a few different times, I saw a sign that said Eastland, Texas, 30 miles. Now, that might not mean anything to you, but it meant something to me because Eastland, Texas uh, had been like a home away from home. My aunt and uncle lived there and I was very close to them. They were like second parents to me. And I found it crazy that I was considering going to Texas A&M University and my parents had never told me, that's incredible because Eastland is right next to College Station, which means you're going to get to see your aunt and uncle who are like second parents. You're going to get to see them a lot. I just want to make sure that I was on the correct course. So I pulled into a gas station and purchased a map of the state of Texas. Do you remember those? So I then <laughs> unfolded the map of Texas. And I just want you to see what I saw. <laughs> That's all I wanted to show you. Let's pray and get out of here. Uh, <laughs> What's amazing is it, it took me three hours to get to that gas station. And at that gas station, I was now four hours away from College Station. St 
standing at that gas station was both sobering and defining. It was sobering because I realized just how far off course I had gotten. And the reason that I had gotten so far off course is because I had convinced myself for a long enough period of time that this is right. And if I just keep going this way, it's all going to work out. It was defining because I was finally able to head in the direction I was supposed to be going the entire time. And I tell you that because my hope right here at the beginning of CLC, my hope is that it's going to feel a little bit like we're pulling over to a gas station and looking at a map. And for some of us here today, it's going to be a sobering moment. And that is the kindness and the miraculous work of the Spirit of God in your life today. That, that the Lord might reach into your life and just help you see, hey, you've been, you've been saying, let's just go a little bit longer. You know what? This is fine. It'll all work out. Let's just go a little bit longer in this direction. And today might be sobering, but it also might be defined because the Lord in his kindness might redirect you so that you can begin to head the direction that you are supposed to be going. So the question that I want to just pose this morning is this. Is there a clear priority in your life and in your church on enjoying God's presence through prayer. That's it. You're like, whoa, 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 like, that's it? Yeah, that's it. Like, there's no other place that we need to start. When we're talking about cultivating something, let's just evaluate and assess. Let's look at the map. Let's just make sure that we haven't gotten so blown off course that we've been missing it for a long time. Is there a clear? What I mean by clear is, is it obvious to you? Is it obvious to the people around you? Is it obvious to your church that there is a priority, which means it takes a higher place than other things in your life and in your church. Is there a priority in your life and in your church on enjoying God's presence through prayer? And my hope, my hope is that some of your stories this week might be God dragged me across the United States. He had me get a hotel room and rent a car and park in a parking garage and get all of my steps in for the day just walking into a church. He did all of that just to bring me back to a place where I began to enjoy God's presence again through prayer. So if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn with me to Matthew 21. We're going to look at a uh, familiar story. Uh, It's the story of Jesus cleansing the temple, and it's just become very meaningful to me. Uh, The Lord has done a lot of work in my life over the last few years on the topic of prayer. God used a book called Forgotten Power to just really open my eyes to to the importance and the power of prayer in my life and in the church, and I can see how how that book has helped just really um, shape my heart for this message today. Matthew 21, we're looking at Jesus cleansing the temple. If you're familiar with the story, this happens uh, during what we know as Holy Week, the week leading up to Easter. It's around the time of Passover, which means that the population of Jerusalem is swelling to about 250,000 people. And all of the adult Jewish males have a responsibility when they come to Jerusalem for the Passover. And that responsibility is to show up and sacrifice an animal and pay a tax that has been ordained by the Mosaic law. And in the midst of all this, here's what it says happens with Jesus, starting in verse 12. It says this, And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written... My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den 
of robbers. So what this story really is, is a story about some leaders in the temple who were way off course. For a long enough period of time, they've just been saying, let's just wait a little bit longer, and this is all going to work out. This has got to be the right way. So remember, all Jewish males are having to do two things. They're having to sacrifice an animal and offer a temple tax. That explains why people are selling animals and exchanging money. They're offering a service to the people who are in attendance. They're trying to make it as easy as possible for people to fulfill the duties that they have. So instead of people having to drag a goat across the Roman Empire, they can just show up and it's there. Instead of having to carry your pigeons for a long traveling time, you can just show up and they're right there. There was only one currency accepted in the temple, but you've got all sorts of currencies from the Roman Empire. So people are able to show up, they're able to make an exchange and get the currency that they needed. So these temple leaders, they're just offering a service to people, but Jesus shows up and goes, dude, perfect rage monster all over the place. (laughs) Starts flipping over tables, You know, in the account in John, which was actually another time, it says he fashioned a whip. Can you just imagine Jesus in the corner like... (laughs) Like, that's such a baller move. Like, I want to be like, you know what, in Timothy a T, on the spot, fashioned a whip. Like, I don't have that tool in my tool belt. But Jesus... That was so unnecessary. Uh, Jesus, he, he... You see his anger. And as Bible teachers, don't we want our people, when they're studying the scripture, always to observe where Jesus shows strong emotion? Because wherever Jesus shows strong emotion, he's showing us what he values. And we want to value what he values. So we should pay attention when Jesus shows a holy anger. See, here's what we have to understand. Jesus' issue wasn't with what the temple leaders were doing. That wasn't the issue. They were providing a service. The issue wasn't what they were doing, it's where they were doing it, and ultimately, why they were doing it there. Where were they doing it? They were doing it in the temple. The temple was the place where where God's presence was said to reside. People were to come to the temple to do what? To meet with God. The temple was to be called, listen to this, the title of the temple was to be house of prayer. If the temple was to be known for anything, it was prayer. The activity that was to align with the temple's identity was prayer. So put those two things together. The temple is where the presence of God resides, and the activity that's supposed to mark the temple is prayer. When people are coming to the temple, they should be coming to pair God's presence with with prayer. And yet Jesus shows up, and he finds a place that is not conducive to that. Like, let me ask you, anyone here ever done their quiet time in Walmart on Black Friday? (laughs) No? Why not? Anyone go to your state fair and specifically go to the petting zoo and just crack that word of God open and soak it in? Why not? It's not conducive. That's why D.A. Carson, when he is writing on this event, he says, instead of solemn dignity in the murmur of prayer, there's the bellowing of cattle and the bleeding of sheep. Instead of brokenness and contrition, holy adoration and prolonged petition, there is noisy commerce. Now watch this. The issue wasn't just where they were doing it, it's why they were doing it there. Why were they doing it there? It's because the priority in the temple had shifted from God's presence to attendance, convenience, and profit. Those were the three priorities. Attendance. You know what the crazy thing is? Don't miss this. This is so important. The crazy thing is that the presence of God had long since departed from the temple and it was just business as usual. 
Isn't that crazy? The presence of God wasn't even there and it was just business as usual. So that's how we know that the values were number one, attendance. People to get in and just do their duty. Not just attendance though, convenience. The leaders want to make it as easy as possible for people to just get in and do what they're supposed to do, but not just that, profit. Temple leaders are like, you know what? Let's hike up the exchange rate. When people choose to bring their own animal, just by coincidence, it's going to fail inspection so that they're going to have to buy a more expensive animal, and then we'll take the animal that they brought and just sell it to some, someone else. It's profit. It's not just, wasn't what they were doing. It's where they were doing it and why they were doing it there. So why are we talking about this now, right here at the beginning of the conference? Why are we talking about the temple? Here it is. Don't miss it. Number one, we are the temple collectively. We are the temple collectively. That's why the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 3 says, do you not know that you, and in the Greek, that you is in the plural. He's speaking to the church in Corinth. He's saying that you guys as the church collectively are God's temple in that God's spirit dwells in you. We are the temple collectively, but not just that. We are the temple individually. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? So this is why we're talking about it because we are the temple collectively but we're also the temple individually. How is this possible? It's possible because first Jesus Christ became the temple. The presence of God manifested itself in the person of Jesus Christ, but instead of animals being sacrificed for the sins of Israel, Jesus Christ himself, his body was broken and his blood was shed for you and for me. And unlike any animal that had ever been sacrificed in the temple, Jesus Christ took his life back from the grave. He rose and conquered Satan's sin and death, making a way when there was no way for you and for me to become God's temple so that God could make himself at home in us. We are the temple collectively and we are the temple individually. So, so don't miss this. Like if you're already tuned out, like welcome back, all right? <laughs> Don't miss what I'm telling you. If the temple signified God's presence, I'm just going to make connections here. Like if the temple signified God's presence and the temple was to be a house of prayer, known for prayer, marked by prayer, and we are now the temple both collectively and individually, then it brings me back to the question I started the conference with. Is there a clear priority in your life and in your church on enjoying God's presence through prayer? That's the question. We have to start there. Is there a clear priority in your life and in your church on enjoying God's presence through prayer or have you gotten off course by prioritizing the same things that were prioritized in the temple? Attendance, convenience, and profit. Let me just tell you, I know what it's like to get blown off course by all three of those things. I know what it's like to prioritize attendance in my personal time with the Lord. Do you know what it's like to have your quiet time because you work in a church? You need to do it. It's a part of your job. You know what that's like? Where you just, you just show up day after day because that's what you're supposed to do because that's what you're employed to do. I know what that's like. I've been there or to prioritize attendance above everything else in the ministry that I'm leading. Like to have an unhealthy obsession with getting more people into the ministry so that there are greater and greater growing numbers. Do you know what that's like? Do you know what it's like to tether your joy or your value to the rise or the fall of attendance numbers? 
Some of y'all might have come here this week just looking for the tips and tricks that might actually help get your attendance back up. You know what the interesting thing about, is about attendance? It only tells you how many people showed up. It doesn't tell you at all if the Spirit of God was moving in their lives or not. But that's what we care about. We, we love taking pictures of our worship centers at Easter because that's going to be the picture that we now put on our website and on our social media just to give people an idea. If you come visit our church, this is what you can expect, which actually isn't what they can expect, but at least on that one day of the year, they can expect that. And we look at filled spaces and we're like, this is it. God is clearly moving. You know what? There's 3,200 people right now. All that tells me is that there's 3,200 people here right now. (laughs) Every single one of you could be checking your phone or tuned out or distracted, thinking about something else, spending your whole time evaluating me so you have no time to actually do business with the Lord. And that would be a royal waste of our time our resources and energy. It says nothing about whether the Spirit of God is moving or not, and yet so many of us base our joy and our value on it. And I know that. I'm saying that because I've lived it. I know what it's like to prioritize convenience. I know what it's like in my own personal time to try and expedite my time with God to make it more efficient because I'm a busy person. To do is is waiting. There's a lot that needs to be accomplished. So let's just try and time box this thing with God. Let's try and cut off the fat so that we can be as efficient as possible to get to serving God. I also know the temptation in ministry to make ministry more convenient for the attenders because I listen to the church consultants. Church consultants who say, you know what, where the church is headed is towards an on-demand experience, and a day is coming where on-demand is going to outpace live events, and so if you're not on board with the on-demand experience, prepare to die. And then you've got Generation Z, and their attention span is shorter than a goldfish. you got about eight seconds. And so what do we need to do? We need to make our sermons shorter. We need to to cut up the the food into bite-sized pieces, and we just need to spoon them the, 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 the small bites because their stomachs can't handle it. And so there's just this temptation to just water everything down. Let's Let's make church shorter. Let's make it more convenient, easier for people to digest it. And then I know what it's like to try and profit off the church. What do I mean by that? I know what it's like to use the platform to pacify my own insecurities. And so I just ask, I I say all of that not to shame anyone. I'm not trying to beat anyone over the head. That's why I'm telling you, hey, I know what all that's like. All I'm trying to do is just say, hey, is that you right now? If it is, hey, that's okay. But let's acknowledge that that we've gotten blown off course. Maybe we've said for too long, hey, it's okay. This is right. Let's just go this way a little bit longer. And maybe God in his kindness is just reaching into your life, grabbing hold of the wheel, jerking it over to a gas station saying, let's just open up the map real quick because there's something better. There's more joy somewhere else. So here's what I want to do. I just want to invite you to look at the map with me so that we can head where we need to go. May we be faithful temples individually and collectively who prioritize God's presence through prayer. So here's what I wanna do. I just, I wanna wanna remind you of a few truths about prayer. 
so that some of y'all might be leaving here saying, I flew across the country for God to grab a hold of my heart. Just like a little kid grabbing his parents' face to say, look at me. It's like God just grabbing our faces gently but firmly just saying, look at me. It's me you want. It's my presence. It, it's, it's only me that can satisfy your soul. And the pathway to doing that is through prayer. So the first thing I want to remind you about prayer is this. The ultimate goal of prayer isn't more from God but more of God. That's the ultimate goal of prayer. It's not to get more from God. It's just to get more of God. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 6, but when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. What's the reward? It's God. So this is where we need to be honest. Let me just encourage you to answer this question. What What do you believe when you walked into this place? What do you believe is the greatest thing God could give you right now? Be honest. Like evaluate where your anxiety is. What you lay awake at night thinking about. What lie have you believed is the greatest gift God could give you? Is it more attendance at church? Is it it more donations at church? Is it just a different church altogether? Is it a better marriage or a different marriage? Like, what do you believe is the best thing God could give you right now? And I just want to lovingly invite you back and say, the greatest gift that God could give all of us today is just more of himself. Like, for God in his kindness to do something that we could never manufacture at a conference, for God to just pour himself out into our lives in such a way that we see him in a way as if we had never seen him before, that God would overwhelm us with the joy of his presence. It's the greatest thing that God could give us. What would it look like for us to pray? I found myself this morning praying this, God, I don't need anything from you except you. I don't need anything from you except you. The second thing I want to remind you about prayer is this. We have an enemy who hates prayer. John Calvin described prayer as the chief exercise of faith. Michael Reeves said that prayerlessness is practical atheism demonstrating a lack of belief in God. So think about what, that's, what that means. If prayer is the, the, chief, the chief act of faith, and prayerlessness is practical atheism, then you better believe that your prayer life has a target on it. That your enemy and my enemy hates our prayer lives. And the greatest thing that he could do is discourage you in your prayer life. I mean, think about the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. What happens when Jesus is calling them to pray? They keep falling asleep, and they fall into temptation. So we have an enemy. Um, a few years ago, I, I was able to take a sabbatical from the ministry that I was leading, and I just began to sit for extended periods of time with the Lord and, and listening to the Lord and just seeing what He wanted to do in my life. And in the midst of those extended times of prayer, God gave me a picture in my mind that reflected my soul. And it fits so well with this theme of cultivate because it was a picture of of soil. And that picture in my mind, that was God's way of just helping me evaluate the state of my soul. And when I started that sabbatical, the soil was, it was bone dry. Like it was cracked. I, I saw this picture of just this cracked soil. There was no rain falling at all. And then as I went through the sabbatical and I began to seek the Lord, spend time in his word and seek his presence through prayer, it was interesting that the Lord kept bringing that picture back to mind. And over time, the rain began to fall and the soil began to uh, become more and more damp. And, And by the end of the sabbatical, it's just like a torrential downpour and the soil is rich and green. And God gave me that picture to... For the future, to know like, hey, this is how I do check-ins with God. What's the state of my soul? And not that long ago, I was just, 
I was checking in with God. What's the state of my soul? And I just realized that it wasn't raining as hard as I would have hoped. And here's the sense that I had. Here's the realization that I had. Is I felt this pull on my life away from the things that actually would bring the rain. Like, I felt this pull away from the things that actually were the things that would stir my soul for the Lord. Specifically, extended time just sitting and being with God and listening to God in prayer. And that pull was the work of the enemy, seeking to distract and discourage me from from prayer. I tell you that just to say, one, what's the state of your soul right now? But number two, are are there... things and disciplines and activities in your life that when you look back in your past, you would say, yeah, these are the things that God has used in my life to stir my heart for the Lord. And yet when you evaluate it, you can tell you've been pulled away from those things. Number three, quantity of time is often what leads to quality time. Quantity of time is often what leads to quality time, I think we at least need to pay attention to verses like Luke 6, 12, where it says, in these days, Jesus went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. Like, we at least need to take that into consideration that God in the flesh himself would spend entire nights with the Lord, or or Anna in Luke chapter 2, verse 37, it says, And then as a widow, until she was 84, she didn't depart from the temple, worshiping and fasting, with worshiping, with fasting and prayer, night and day. I remember a friend and mentor of mine, Brian Fisher, College Station, he would say, hey man, he would talk to me about parenting, and he would just say, hey man, you can't play in quality time with your kids. You can only play in quantity of time with your kids. And it makes sense because I've got three boys. And the reality is I could be really busy and I could decide I've got 10 minutes. I'm going to make this the best 10 minutes I've ever had with my boys. But at the same time, those three boys could be huddled up in one of their rooms saying, okay, this is where we carry out a mutiny against our dad. (laughs) Like you do your... Okay, you're going to lose your ever-loving mind when we walk out. You're going to punch me in the face. Let's do it. You can't plan quality time. You can only plan quantity of time. And often in parenting, it's the quantity of time that bursts the quality time. And look, I understand. We, we, we have jobs and And life is busy, but I firmly believe, and I I hope you hear what I'm about to say, I firmly believe that an aspect of full surrender in our culture today, when we talk about living fully surrendered to Jesus, I firmly believe that an aspect of full surrender in our culture today is a relentless pursuit of unhurried undistracted and inefficient time with Jesus in a culture that thrives on hurried distraction and efficiency. Like that's full surrender. That you would fight for the unhurried, undistracted, inefficient time with Jesus that you would even enjoy wasting time with Jesus just to be with him. Number four, being with and listening to God is just as important as talking to God. Being with and listening to God is just as important as talking to God. When I went on that sabbatical, a friend of mine drew, he's like, man, you should read this book called Chair Time. It's about 35 pages long. I was like, all right. So I picked it up and it's just this book with this challenge of like, hey, 15 minutes a day, every day for 30 days, find a chair, sit in that chair and just sit and listen. Like you're not praying, you're not talking, you're just listening. Because the idea of the book is, you know what? If you got to walk into the throne room of God right now, like what do you think you would do? Do you think you'd walk in and be like, Jesus, I'm glad you're here. Let me talk to you about a few things. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know our fiscal year ends, right? 
You, you, you know my, my spouse is a difficult person, right? <laughs> no, the, the point of the book is you wouldn't walk in and be like, hey, let me talk to you about some things. You would just walk in and you would shut your mouth. And you'd just say, you can talk about whatever. I'll, I'll just listen. And so that's what I started doing is I'd just sit and I'd listen. I'd say, God, the conversation is yours. We can talk about whatever you want to talk about. And God began to reveal to me that my tendency in prayer is to just come to him and it's one-sided. I just show up and I talk and after I talk, I feel better and I go on my way. But the person who really should be driving the conversation is God. And so I began to sit with his word and I would listen to him through his word and then I would spend time meditating on what I had just read and I would spend 15 minutes just listening to the Lord. And what's interesting is that during that time, the Lord would speak to my heart. And yet I remember one time when I was sitting there and I I felt like I was just sitting. And toward the end of the 15 minutes, uh, God brought to mind Psalm 1611 where David says, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And in that moment, uh, God was tapping into my need to always be talking if I'm with someone. Like people around the office know I'm a pretty awkward person. Like I don't want to ride in the same car to lunch with other people because I don't want to run out of things to talk about. So I'm like, I'll just meet you there. When I go on a date with my wife, I've got conversation cards in my back pocket. So if you, if you see me at a restaurant and I'm like this, I'm not checking my phone. I'm just seeing what the next question is because I'm like, I don't want awkward silence. Let's just keep the conversation going. And God was like, no, in my presence, not in my presence when we're talking, but just in my presence, there's fullness of joy. Like we can just sit together and enjoy one another. And it was then that I began to taste and see just how good God is and just how pleasing and delightful and precious the presence of God really is. And so I just encourage you, being with and listening to God is just as important as talking to God. Number five, there is a difference between a praying church and a church that prays. There's a difference. There's a difference between being a praying church and a church that prays. If you don't believe me, just go do a word search on prayer through the book of Acts. The prayer shows up about 30 different times. And I'll just speak to our experience here at Watermark. Being in a church this size, you know what the temptation is? You just got to move fast. So you know what the tendency is? It's to value strategy over sensitivity. So it's like, we just got to go, man. We got, let's just hire strategic thinkers. Let's get in a room. Let's strategize this. And then let's just put processes and procedures into place so that we don't have to think about it again. We can just look at the calendar and be like, this is what we do once a month. Let's just do that until Jesus comes back. The plan is in place. The process is in place. So we don't ever have to stop again and ask God, is this even what you want us doing? It's just easier to activate instead of to ask. God, what do you want us to do? And so we're just in the process of just saying, you know what, let's just not assume that our people pray. Let's just make it like one of our markers, like we want to be a praying church. So over the last three months, like we did 21 days of prayer and fasting, like for the first time. And some of you are like, we do that every year. Awesome, keep doing it, never stop it. Like that is something you should just put on repeat. But like we, we entered 21 days of prayer and fasting. It was, it was so refreshing. We've begun to pray more in our worship services. We, we've started doing nights of prayer in worship. Let me just say this. Prayer is, is enough of a reason for your people to gather. Like I hate if people are like, well, what are we doing tonight? Are we just praying? Yep, that's it. <laughs> that's it. Nothing else. So you definitely shouldn't miss. Prayer is plenty of reason for your people to gather. As Easter, the the week before Easter, the staff, we prayed. People signed up for 15-minute slots for the entire week to pray almost, almost around the clock for Easter. We called our people to pray for the 40 days leading up to Easter for one unbeliever. 
by name. We've challenged our community groups to pray for an entire, just for an hour straight. Like, don't do anything else except pray. When our executive team is meeting, we have a long agenda, and we just pray for every item on the agenda before we talk about it. Our elders have started praying for 30 to 45 minutes at the beginning of the meeting before we talk business. We're praying more in our staff meetings. We're praying more fervently before our Sunday gatherings. And I don't tell you that to say, look at us. I'm telling you to say, hey, we're just catching up. Like for too long. Watermark was known for, for doing good, for valuing community. And those are great things, and we always want to be known for those things, but I don't know that people would look and say, yeah, that's a house of prayer. They're marked by prayer. I know that they are praying constantly and fervently. If you want to pray, go to Watermark. But if you don't want to pray, you should stay away from that place. There's a difference. And then finally, prayer turns ruts into revival. Prayer turns ruts into revival. You know what, you know what my fear is of a place like Watermark? My fear is that it would be a little bit like the temple, like the presence of God has departed and it's just business as usual. Because we'd look and be like, you know what, Sunday mornings, this place is fairly full at Enough people are waking up on Sunday morning in just in the natural rhythm of pointing their car toward Watermark Community Church. So it'd be easy for us to look around and be like, you know what, enough people are coming and we've got the porch on Tuesdays, young adults are showing up and we've got regen and people are showing up and it would just be easy for us to look around and say, yeah, we're doing it. So a question that we've just been talking about is if the Spirit of God wasn't moving, would we even know it? Would we even know it? It's possible for us to look around and be like, things are great, and we're actually in a rut. The reality is for us here at Watermark, I mean, we have members who are spiritually apathetic and distracted. We've got plenty of community groups that are just hanging by a thread. We have marriages that are dissolving. We have people who are still hiding in sin and living a lie. We have countless people with serious physical illnesses and issues. We have children who are struggling. We live in a country on a moral landslide, and there's roughly 3 billion people in the world that have little to no access to the gospel. And I share all that with you to just say, look, we here at Watermark, we are in need of revival. We're in need of something. We want want more of God. We want more of God's presence. We want people walking into their doors on Sunday morning and feeling like they're hitting a brick wall of God's presence, that they run into his presence Sensing God is here, and I can't just sit here distracted when the God of the universe wants to meet with me. So I don't know if that's you personally. I don't know if that's you and your church that you might look and say, you know what? We're in need of revival. If that's you, I just want to encourage you with the words of W.A. McKay. He says, when Elijah prayed, the nation was reformed. When Hezekiah prayed, the people were healed. When the disciples prayed, Pentecost appeared. When John Wesley and his companions prayed, England was revived. When John Knox prayed, Scotland was refreshed. When the Sabbath school teachers at Tannebrake prayed, 11,000 were added to the church in one year. When Luther prayed, the papacy was shaken. When Baxter prayed, Kidderminster was aroused. In the lives of Whitfield, Payson, Edwards, Tennant, whole nights of prayer were succeeded by whole days of soul winning. To your knees, then, ye Christians. Plead until the windows open. Plead until the springs unlock. Plead until the clouds part. Plead until the rains descend, plead until the floods of blessing come. Is there a priority in your life and in your church on the presence of God through prayer? My hope is that this morning just feels a little bit like a pullover to a gas station, opening a map. My hope is that some of y'all might say, that's why God brought me here this week. 
It's to bring me back to enjoying his presence through prayer. Let's pray together. Here's what I want to invite you to do. You know, we could just pray. I could pray and we could just sing more songs and bolt out of here. But if we're talking on prayer, it, it feels like an appropriate thing to do to just give you space to pray. And so we're just, I'm not going to ask for anything from the band yet. And I just want to give you the space right now to just sit still before the Lord. And my encouragement is don't do a lot of talking. If you need to confess, confess. Wherever there's been a prioritization of attendance, convenience, profit, confess it. But just sit in the presence of the Lord and enjoy his presence through prayer. God, I pray that right now you would come and meet with us that you would give us a deep awareness of who you are and what you're doing in our midst. Would you just call us back to you, God? Wherever we've gone off course, I pray that it would feel like a sobering yet defining moment where you just point us back in the right direction, that we would long for the simplicity and the beauty and the delight of your presence through prayer. And so we just give this space and this time to you right now. Hey, friends. Well, thanks so much for listening today. As always, if you have any questions, if you have any comments, if you have any ideas for future episodes, we would love to hear from you. Best way to do that, clp at watermark.org. That's clp at watermark.org. Thanks so much again for listening. We'll talk to you again next time.